Hey everyone, this is Ross, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits and a lot about vegetables and how to use all that stuff in the kitchen and also how to grow it and a lot of the weird and interesting fruits that you probably haven't heard of or you don't grow yourself. We love to talk about figs and in tonight's episode we're going to be talking about just that. Um, I want to lay out my plans because now it's the winter time, we're inside, nothing's growing. I want to lay out my plans as we should be, right? We should be planning at this time of the year. Um, I want to discuss with you guys what my plans are for this upcoming season. What are some of the things that I'm hoping for? What are some of the things that I'm going to be doing? Maybe something different. Um, you know, change a little bit of something around. You guys kind of get the point, right? So uh, I guess to quickly recap my 2018 season, we were in, I think, year six of growing figs, and we really have done uh, phenomenal because our weather was so perfect. We got off to a really nice head start. Our spring was very warm. Our winter was very mild. Um, we quickly learned how to heat up the ground. We really learned some interesting techniques about heating up the ground. There's something I may consider trying, something new I may consider trying that uh, Brent, if you're watching, I think he was the one who sent me um, this idea and he came out with it. And I think he said he was going to test and see if this idea works. I haven't really heard back, but essentially we're going to try to come up with better ways to warm up the ground. That's exactly what we did last year and it worked so, so well. Heating up that soil, whether it's in a pot or in the ground, is so important. Um, then our season really it kind of progressed really well. We had a little bit of a rainy period, I think, sometime in, in May, um, sometime in, in June. Uh, but most of the year was, in terms of the fig season, in terms of when they actually ripened, it was very dry. Um, I was very surprised, very pleased. We had a long season. Even the fall lasted for a long time before the winter months came in or the winter temperatures came in and things really cooled down too quickly. Um, I was very shocked. We had a lot of figs this year. We not only had, <clears throat> you know, not only did we have like figs from pretty much every day from sometime in July till the end of the year, um, we had a number of plates. There was a point of the season around like mid to, to mid-August to mid-September. I think we had a plate of figs, like a genuine plate every day um so we really had nice production we had a number of varieties we got to try for the first time we got better thoughts on certain varieties we uh really expanded our minds in terms of different techniques that we used like um things like girdling um let's see what else did we learn there was a lot of there was a lot of techniques that we've learned this uh this past season if i go to our blog here figboss.com I think you guys can see my end of season thoughts I may have I may have put this on here or not but this will give me a good idea we learned a lot about rejuvenation pruning that was a big one we learned a lot about um, pruning as well and that we shouldn't be pruning too much our trees too much we really should be lightly pruning or really just taking off the tips and that's kind of it uh, rejuvenation pruning is great if you're going to be trying to renew your tree, trying to get your tree more healthy, um, cut out some of that weaker growth and, and slower growth and more diseased wood. Um, we also really solidified our thoughts on soil moisture. A consistent soil moisture is really important. Uh, we did try this year the bags, the, the trash bags on top of our pots to keep out all that excess water. I think they worked really, really well. Um, the fruit quality stayed pretty high throughout the season because the soil was able to be kept dry. Even if it did rain, I know it really wasn't the best test this year. 
Um, cause it was, it was such a dry year, but it really did work out well, uh, for a lot of my trees. We didn't have a whole lot of SWD this year. We didn't have a whole lot of damage of anything. We didn't have a whole lot of splitting. We barely had any cracking. Um, we had such incredible fruit quality this, this, uh, past season. It was impressive. Um, let's see here. I also really learned a lot about rootstocks and I really think that specific varieties should just be on specific rootstocks. If I go to our figs, I think you guys can see, I didn't, haven't put my end of season thoughts onto, um, onto my blog just yet. But if you go here to this post, we talked about reducing splitting, dealing with SWD, avoiding cracking, uh, having a short hang time. I've realized that a lot of my figs that I've really love, I really love them. Things like Suwadi and White Triana, they just have such a long hang time that anything can happen to those figs in that period, right? If it's taking 10, 12, 15 days for them to be perfectly ripe or to even start to dry up on the tree, it's just too long because that's just a too long of a period for our weather, for something bad to happen with our weather. Um, I am considering, and we'll get into this maybe in a bit here, I'm considering two different methods of growing figs in containers. I think that there's two legit methods out there. I wonder really which one's better. Uh, I've in the past have described them and I think maybe an episode of Fruit Talk. Um, but certainly on our YouTube channel, we talked about method A versus method B and that there's two different methods and there's variations of those methods of growing figs in containers. We did get to identify some potential synonyms that were uh, lurking around the community. Um, we found some really impressive varieties as well. Things like De La Roca, I was extremely impressed with that we haven't been really exposed to that much before. Things like Sucret, Neruciolo de Elba, Verdino del Nord, LSU Tiger, Albo, Hated de Argentile, the Daloso, Pastillier, Socorro Black, LSU Huye, Moro de Caneva, Campaneri, De La Senora Havernenka. Um, also the Dells Ermitons, which I don't think is on this, this list. And Blanche de Du Cezanne, Del San Juan Migran. Uh, those were a lot of the figs that we kind of got extra time with this year and was able to really accurately identify how beautiful and, and um, tasty those varieties were. I've particularly been very impressed with a couple of these varieties that we're going to go over in, in um, a later point of this, this episode here. Uh, we did post on this thing here. We even talked about our our ripening order, uh, we have a whole album of the photos that of, that we grew. I tried to take as many photos as I could this year. We have a list of my favorite figs. Uh, we have a list of varieties with a thick and dense texture that I've learned is definitely my favorite category of fig. And also figs I found that do well here are figs that have the ability to dry or drying capabilities. Not all of them do. Some of them definitely have better drying capabilities than others, I should say. We also found a, a list of varieties that I put together with an elegant berry flavor. It's a very elegant piece of fruit. We have some that have uncommon characteristics, special growing requirements. We even put together a huge coal list. At the end of our season, we got rid of a ton of pots. We put a lot of them in the ground. We sold a lot of them as bare rooted trees. Um, we really have reduced our collection in a big way. Our storage area now is much more well suited to better conditions. Because we have less trees, we have much better conditions. We're gonna have a lot more room on the patio. I also learned at the end of my season that we have just not enough sunlight in the later months of the year. Things like September and October. The sun is kind of like it is in March at that time of the year, right? Because June, Sometime in June, we have that summer solstice, or the longest day of the year. Um, pretty soon, it's going to be the shortest day of the year, thank goodness, because it's gets, it just gets way too dark here too soon. Um, so then once we have that 
summer solstice, it starts to get darker a lot earlier. And by the time it's around September and October, we just do not have the sunlight in certain locations on the patio, right? All the, the trees get taller and taller every year as well. And it just, the season, it, it just makes the, the issue a lot worse. So we're going to move things around. We're going to reorganize. Um, so that's definitely something we're going to do next year. Um, I also have a list of varieties that I think do not really like big hormonal changes. They need to be kept in balance, in the right hormonal balance um, for the entirety of them existing. Um, there's some trees that really do not like being hard pruned more than others, I find. We also have a list of varieties that very, very easily put out fruit, and I think you could almost do anything to them. We have uh, a rating system here. A number of varieties that actually reached the quality or close to the quality of a black Madeira or a Col de Dom. Um, I was very impressed by a number of varieties this year and a lot of them actually come from Spain. Um, some of these varieties that are from Ponza's collection like Dels Hermitans, De La Senora, De La Roca and the Col de Doms. Um, yeah, overly impressed. And then of course there's the black Madeira. Um, now what I've also been doing this year, I think one of the bigger points I want to make here with this video is that we have been mostly consolidating our collection. We have been lowering the number of pots that we have. We've been putting a lot of those in the ground, but also getting rid of pots. I would like to stay at the number I'm currently at. I think there's a specific number that I can, I can, uh, comfortably handle and comfortably um, I think it's worth growing and there's a number of these on the patio in in the right areas and the right spots um, if I kind of go over this number then we have a storage issue and then we we run into sort of like a, a production issue um, in the greenhouse that is so we're gonna have a number of these trees that are gonna get up potted we grew a number of copies we, we duplicated a number of varieties that we really liked we talked about that in prior videos on the YouTube channel basically things like Smith Azores dark um, what else did we make copies of we made some copies actually of black Celeste um, let's see what else do we have Oh, Campaneri was another one we made a number of copies of Pastelier um, let's see here. We have a number of copies actually of Long to Dute, La Magdalene. We put a number of these, um, some of them in the ground. Um, we made a number of copies of Aishia Black from different sources. We have, let's see, a number of copies of Fico Love because it's quite hardy. We're trying to propagate a lot of De La Roca, Borgia Soak Reese. Uh, the Blanche de Duce Cezanne. Let's see, what else do we have here? It says I have two Detraces Blaze, but I'm pretty sure I got, yeah. I actually got rid of this one. So we'll red this one out. This one I sold. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What else are we making copies of? Malta Black, if you can believe it or not. Such an incredible fig. Uh, Neruciola de Elba, we're going to get into that in a minute. Ron de Bordeaux is another one that we're, we were making copies of for a time. Smith, as we mentioned. Azores Dark, we mentioned. Uh, and the Verdino del Nord, um, that actually comes from originally Vladimiro Rocco. It's also called Figoin. Uh, this may, this fig has many names. It's wonderful. Point is, is that we have a number of these figs that we've made copies of. We're going to keep a lot of them in pots. We're going to have a good production from some of the potted trees. I want to have a number of Smith, a number of different Pastelier, all these different things I mentioned. Some of them more so in pots, some of them more so in the ground, but... To have this reliable production from a certain variety 
or a, or a handful of different varieties from the pots, that's the key. Also to have a, a number of reliable production from a handful of varieties in the ground is also another key. So that was kind of my move last year to then focus on this year. So we planted a lot of them last year, but um, we do have a number of them that were in five gallon size pots. We still have like, I don't know, 20 or so trees that are in five gallon size pots. A number of those are gonna get up potted this year into 10 gallons because I want them to be in these larger pots. Um, we're also going to remove a number of these pots I currently have in larger pots. So we'll free up that number of large pots that we can handle. And then that way we're going to keep that number correct. I'm going to make sure I count, make sure I have the right number of these so I don't go over that number. And we can really be skeptical and careful as to what varieties we put into larger pots. Now the smaller pots, the five gallon size pots, I can have a, a really large amount of those I find. Um, and that's the plan is that those don't take up nearly as much storage space. It's not a whole lot to take care of them, to move them around, to do anything to them really. It's kind of a breeze. I actually really more enjoy working with those but the issue is you don't get nearly as much production for the amount of space it's it's a lot of work to take care of so many trees especially if there's a lot of them in five gallons so i'd rather have fewer but bigger trees in the end but for now we're going to have a number of copies of of so many new varieties actually believe it or not we called a lot of varieties out of our collection but we're adding i think dare i say even more well that's not true that's just, that is not true. We're actually, this is gonna be the first year that we're adding less uh, than we've gotten rid of. So we've gotten rid of more than we're adding, which is a great sign. <laughs> and we're finally in the, in the decline. There's really not a whole lot more that I'm personally looking for, or even wanna try. Um, so we got rid of, I would say, probably somewhere around 60 varieties and this year we're probably adding around 45 um, and these different trees that we're adding we're going to keep them in five gallon size pots so they're going to hang out on the patio they're going to grow themselves out if we're going to get any production out of them it's whatever i'm not really concerned i kind of want to get a handle on them not this upcoming season but the next upcoming season because that's just kind of how this all works. We're going to do very little grafting. Most of it's going to be rooting. Um, and those trees will just hang out in five gallon size pots. And we'll kind of even, you know, we don't even really have to separate them very far. We're going to kind of clump them all up together. Not really care too much about them. Uh, we're we're going to feed them like we do the other trees. We're going to water them like we do the other trees. But um, it's not really going to be the main my main focus it's just going to be something that um, really is not going to need a whole lot of attention um, so I think that kind of justifies it for me um, if they needed a lot of attention then it, maybe it's just not worth it um, but to try all these new varieties I think it's worth growing them in five gallon size pots first taste the fruit for you know a number of years get them to at least two or three years old before you make a decision um, figure out if you can get them to that right fruit quality they all have this right fruit quality that will kind of really make it or break it for you right if you can get them to that fruit quality then i think you can make a decision if you can't um then maybe it's worth holding on to them for another year but uh we can make some fast quick judgments on some of these and eventually whittle them whittle them away um but i do believe that any of the varieties I'm adding at this point have a very high chance of success here. Um, I've really narrowed it down as to what that fig is that does well here um, versus not, right? I think that's actually a skill that a lot of you guys will eventually get. Um, it's kind of just like, I don't know, picking out a nice piece of fruit at the grocery store and getting really good at that, you know what I mean? Um, you'll eventually figure it out. You see enough photos of anything, you'll know what's good and what's not, right? It's kind of like looking at a, a glass of wine and knowing kind of what it's gonna taste like or what it should taste like 
beforehand or smelling the wine and knowing it's a nice little preview of what's to come, right? Um, so that's kind of it's kind of the way I see it. Um, so in terms of those pot, the potted varieties, that's what, that's what we just covered. But now in terms of the, the in-ground trees, we're going to have still, we still have a number of spots, believe it or not. We still have a number of spots that I would like to plant a number of varieties in the ground here. Um, varieties, hopefully that we don't necessarily, um, we don't, we're not really necessarily sure that they're going to work out totally. I think it's, um, a, a great idea. And this is actually through the help of my uncle. Um, he is going to let me use his land for, um, commercial fig production. Um, I'm not entirely sure how many trees I'm going to be able to plant at his property, but he is going to let me use, I would, I would imagine a pretty decent amount of land. He has pretty good sunlight. Um, it's really only, it's less than 10 minutes away from my house. So, um, everything will be pretty close together and I can always go over there and, and sell the fruit from those trees as well as my own. The goal though with his property is to really plant varieties that I think are have a very, very high success rate of sticking around. You know, I, I'm almost seeing my uncle's place as a as a as a new a new second orchard. Um, to do everything right from the start. And um, this orchard here, I've been experimenting, experimenting, experimenting. So I'm trying to plant as many different varieties in the ground that I can see what really really does well better than others and then from there take those varieties over to his place and plant really just those i would i would pretty much settle on maybe even one variety um at his place um i definitely think the the one variety that i'm i'm kind of banking on right now um for in-ground production is Neruciolo de Elba. I think that is the number one choice for this climate, for being able to market it, um, for having a great overall, overall flavor. The key with this variety that puts it above the rest, I think, is that it is extremely, extremely good with moisture. It also has an incredible ability to dry on the tree and off the tree, and it happens very, very quickly. It's not the earliest fig in the world, but it's early enough that I'm going to get an entire full crop out of this fig. Um, it puts out a lot of fruit. It doesn't grow very quickly. However, um, it is a very small fruit, and this is kind of the one downside, but to me, it doesn't really matter. Um, about the size of the fruit. It is going to matter to the consumer, but I promise you your these figs are going to be better than the figs you can get from California. Um, even though they're smaller, they will be significantly better. They're not going to spoil either. And that I think is the key. These figs are so difficult to spoil that it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Um, like I said, they dry on and off the tree. These things are so easy to dry um, that I can have a semi-dried fig in six days on the tree. If I pick that at five, at day five or even day four, that fig is pretty much like it was picked like it was in California, right? Let's say day day three or let's say day four. That's like a fig I'm picking in, that they pick in California. They pick them very early, maybe even day three, honestly. Somewhere around that, like day three and a half. That's the quality that they pick in California. I could pick it though, however, at day five or day six, and then I could have a, a, a higher quality that isn't gonna spoil. It's kind of nuts. And I could market them in a, in a way that I think is very um, smart. And I think people will go nuts for these. They have a, a interesting bitterness to them, though. And the bitterness comes out a lot more in the fall than it is in the summer. And that can definitely be a downside to this variety. Um, 
that I think is going to be key, and I need to play around with that because that's not something I personally liked with these fakes. Um, it's definitely an incredible variety when ripened in the right conditions, but towards the end of the, the very end of the season, they got very bitter. And because they were so bitter, uh, it's just not that great. The skin is, is quite bitter on it. What I do find is that because it's so small, because it has such great drying capabilities, it just handles this climate perfectly. You can't really ask for a better fig. There are some others that I think could compete with this, and we need to do some testing, obviously. I'm trying to find something better. But the the you cannot it's undeniable that this is like the perfect fig here. I really do think that. Um I really do. Uh, so far I'm putting it above everything else. Um for just rely for just an overall best fig. Um Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a pretty I think that's a pretty accurate statement from what I've seen so far. Um, so that's my my goal is to try to figure out which varieties I really like. I'm I'm tempted. I'm gonna be propagating every cutting I possibly can that I took this year from my my New Richello to Elba trees, and then I'm going to propagate them and plant as many of those at my uncle's house as well as a different a couple different varieties. Um, probably Campanieri as well. I'm not entirely sold on that just yet but it is such a hardy tree that i could probably plant them off somewhere that i'm not going to protect let's say and um try to get fruit that way um i think that's a good experiment for a couple of these varieties that are just super super hardy is maybe stick them somewhere and just see what happens you know and um you know those might be you know, at the end of the day, that's not really something I want to do, but it could be very, very possible that in the right microclimate with the right genetics, I have a variety that survives the cold here, um, gets to a very large size, and therefore I have incredible production. I don't have to really be cutting them all back to 6 to 12 inches or bending limbs and covering those. Um, it's, it could be a very nice way of growing figs. It's probably the best way you can get figs without a greenhouse um, because you're going to get very early production and you're going to get a lot of it. Um, that's definitely the best scenario possible. So um, there is some hope with that and um, I don't want to give up on that dream because I think it's still possible. Um, there's a number of trees I have planted in the front of the house that I think could potentially do that. Uh, at least Campanaria, I have one of them in the ground that I would like to, I'm protecting it this year, but next year it will not get any protection, I think. And that will be the big test of whether or not that will survive. Um, so that's something I want to do this year is to test we can't test it this year but next year i would like to test the hardiness and limb bending covering limbs um, i'd like to see if i can get more information we will we will learn a lot more information on growing figs in the greenhouse for commercial production um, having our capra fig in there training them as a japanese espier um, also colonizing the fig wasp that's going to be a big thing we do this year um and it's going to be an interesting to see how the production changes because now we have a number of two-year-old trees that are in the ground or will be two years old next year really in that third or fourth year is where you get the most production but year two we're going to get something we should get something from all the in-ground trees that'll be something to see Assuming we do everything right, we have the, a great season from the start. Um, you know, we don't make any mistakes here. Um, but it'll be interesting, I think, to see how that production shifts from away from the pots into the in-ground trees. 
you know the pots is very experimental my in-ground orchard here is experimental but then over at my uncle's place is going to be something that's uh you know not not experimental and hopefully very set in stone um so yeah super interesting um how a lot of this is going to end up working out i'm i'm super excited for it to be honest with you um what else do we want to try this upcoming season well, we're going to have, like I said, a number of new varieties. So that's always really fun and interesting. Um, I would like to see probably very specific varieties here, how they do. I think there's a number of these that are kind of on the fence for me. Things like Black Sidar, Blavetta Campos, Brojoto Nero, Masseria, De La Cassetta. A number of these varieties are I'm kind of on the fence on. We'll see how they do. Um, I'm so excited to see how Campaneri plays out. Some of these new varieties that I'm going to be able, to, or I am, uh, I've have, I have acquired already um, from friends. Um, let's see here. I want to be able to really refine this list right here. This is really, I think, um, a pretty damn good list. You know, this is the list of varieties that. I think are keepers here in this climate and I think some of these maybe don't belong on here there's some of these that could get eliminated next year and we'll be able to really thin this out I think we're gonna eventually come to this point pretty soon because recently when we got rid of a lot of our trees when we did our big cull and you can see them all highlighted in red it was pretty cut and dry it wasn't too difficult to make some of these decisions pretty soon it is going to get very difficult because what is going to inevitably happen is that this we're going to have to have this conversation where you're going to have to say all right well i like this fig on on the right but i also like this fig on the left and i think the question you really have to ask yourself is anything redundant does anything not really have its place somewhere and eventually you'll figure that out and I think it's true they all have some redundancy somewhere with these varieties like as an example is Borgia Soak Grease the same as Violet Sapor and the same as Socorro Black so I may only keep one of those varieties or I may just consider them all the same thing and call it a day right so that could eliminate three on this list or two on this list you know, also like, uh, you know, maybe one of these turns out to be not so great in the rain, like Planera. Maybe I can't get it to work. Maybe it's not really worth it to me. Um, maybe the Moro de Caneva as a, as a potential redundancy beats the Violet de Bordeaux because it's so similar in my opinion in terms of flavor. I find them quite similar in terms of flavor. The Moro de Caneva is also one of those figs that I would like to plant in the front of the house and let that get through um, our winter time uh, without any protection. Um, you know, there's a number of these figs that just may be a little redundant. And because of that, they don't really have a space in this list. And they shouldn't be on this list, right? So we'll have to figure out what that is exactly. Like Col Noir, is that the same as Sucret? Um, you know, the Paradiso Ciro was uh, was splitting a little bit this year. The De La Roca, is this just a superior Col de Dom that it's going to replace all the other Col de Doms? Can we eventually replace Black Madeira? You know, these are some of the questions I'm kind of going to ask myself this year. Uh, in terms of these varieties, it, you know, is anything really redundant? Um, let's see here. What are some of these other things that I would like to... So I have a to-do list over here. There's actually a couple varieties that I would like to resume growth. I had grafted onto them prior, St. Rita, Blava Campanera, and Marala. I would like them to grow and actually see what ends up happening to those. Um, 
reacquire the variety because you because they are rootstock it's not impossible to regain that variety anymore um, i would like to plant a number of varieties here in the ground um, whether or not i think they would do well or whether or not i'd like to have them in the ground to be able to propagate them to propagate from um, i think lampira one is a little too late as i was told and it may not do well here so I may end up digging one of these up and putting it into a pot. Um, although I would like to have one of them in the ground to be able to propagate from. The same thing with Delson Wami Gran. I think there's a potential that Delson Wami Gran could do well here, particularly in the greenhouse. And in the greenhouse, I'm going to dig up the panache tree that I planted in there because I've realized late in the season it's very humid. The panache is just not going to do well. Um, what I need to do is actually put on the heater late in the season um, to keep it dry in the greenhouse. Um, I would also like to plant De La Roca because I want many copies of this tree, right? Eventually, I think it will replace the Col de Dames. Uban, right? Potential to be good in the ground here. Aishia Black UC Davis. I think you, Aishia Black UC Davis is the... One of the perfect trees to put in the ground because it's it's not that healthy. It really needs some extra help. You put it in the ground, you could also, it just gets super vigorous, and then you can propagate from that and have a very healthy stock of Aishia Black. Then we can then start grafting a number of those trees. Aishia Black, I would imagine, is in my top five. Um, and I would like to have a number of them in containers. I should say my top five for containers. You can't really do well with that one in the ground. It's really just going to be planted there to propagate from. Um, same thing with a number of these other varieties. Plant them in the ground to see how well they do, etc., etc. I'd also like to air layer a few trees because we have some that were grafted onto rootstock. Either I don't like the rootstock or I want to reclaim the rootstock. Or I would rather have them on their own roots. Or I would rather have them um, off of the rootstock itself. You know, maybe I want to put this thing in the ground. Maybe I would like to um, have it in its own separate pot. Maybe it's a variety I really like, like Strawberry Verte and Albo. You know, those are varieties that I could potentially just not um, just not want to have grafted in a frankenfig situation. I'd rather have give it its own pot, its own little attention, yada, yada, yada. Then we have some things like uh, extras. And these are some of the figs here that I would like to propagate and make a copy of, as an example. Make copies of, either keep them in a pot or make the copy and put them in the ground. Um, and then we still have to put together our rooting list and our grafting list. I'm not entirely sure how this rooting list differs yet from the extra list, but you know, it is what it is. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure they're the same, they're the same exact thing, but, uh, you know, we're going to keep track of what varieties we're rooting and in what quantity, how well they're doing. Also keep track of potential varieties that we're going to graft this upcoming season it's not going to be a whole lot um and that is kind of it for the season there's not a whole lot i would like to do differently um in terms of practice putting things into practice i'd like to see how the girdling works out this season especially in the spring because we are going to girdle a number of these trees to reduce the sap flow um, to change up the hormones in those trees so that we can slow down their vigor and get them into hormonal balance um, so that they can fruit. Um, let's see, what other techniques are we going to be employing this year? Maybe our blog has some helpful hints. I am this right now in a way uh, right now, but also in the spring, I didn't do enough of this in the spring and right now in the fall, 
But in the spring, I'm going to be rejuvenation pruning pretty much every one pretty much every newly rooted cutting I have. So if I rooted it last year, it's in a five gallon size pot. In the beginning of this season, I'm going to rejuvenation prune it, prune it basically all the way back to a number of buds, let it re-sprout so that I can have a very healthy base to start from. That's definitely key. Um, big time, big time key getting these trees off to the right start. That's something pretty much new that we're going to be doing. Um, let's see here. If I go back to our figs and I look at some of my more recent posts, we can get some more ideas here. Positive and negative experiences. That was a very helpful thread. Um, let's see here. That's one thing I would like to do. I just realized I would like to figure out some of these more flavor profiles that we've talked about in an episode, in a, uh, a video that we do every year, talking about the many flavors of figs. One area I'd like to find a good standard fig from is the caramel flavor profile, and also solidify these flavor profiles even further potentially add some more and then select from each one which fig I like the most um, that's most deserving to stick around um, so that I can really narrow this down for myself um, let's see here what else um, I'd like to dry more figs this year I think um, I've learned at the end of my season that we 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 had a lot of figs that were sitting on our counter or even just sitting in our fridge and they ended up drying up in the fridge um, they didn't even spoil and I was very shocked to see that I think we're gonna take drying a bit more seriously I really like dried figs um, let's see what else we got here. I really think that's mostly it here, guys. Yeah. So I want to thank everybody here for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. I hope you guys uh, are inspired by this in some way. I hope you guys can put together your own little list of things that you're looking forward to doing this year with your figs or even anything, whether it's your gardens, um, other fruit trees, whatever it is. I think it's really important, guys. Don't overlook it. Um, if you enjoyed this episode of Fruit Talk, consider supporting us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash rossratty. No pressure, guys. I want to thank everybody here for watching this episode. We will see you next week. Um, and believe it or not, next week, I think we're actually going to be with my buddy Dom doing that episode we've been talking about for weeks. And then maybe the week after that, we'll have a live episode for those of you guys who have been wanting that for a while. We may have a, a strong enough connection in the future to do a live stream, uh, live stream episode. So... I want to thank everybody here for watching this one. We'll see you next week, guys. Take care.